Hey there, 8855. I'm going to be guest lecturing about population and samples this week. So I want to remind you all to review this PowerPoint that's posted in the modules and also the content in the modules, as there are some definitions and vocabulary that I think would be really good to understand as I'm working through this lecture. So as we get into population and samples, we're also going to think about the sampling techniques that we use to access this population or access our population. So there's two types, non-probabilistic sampling and probabilistic sampling. The first non-probabilistic sampling is where we have non-random sampling techniques. We cannot generalize back to our population. Probabilistic sampling is where each individual has an equal, non-zero, and independent chance of being selected. So um, our subjects are independent from one another. They aren't dependent on the group or another participant in the study. Um, and this is also important that you know your frame of your study. So our first sampling technique for a non-probabilistic sample is accidental also known as chunk or convenience sampling. This is where we will have easily available subjects for a study. There is a lot of weakness of this sampling technique because in the way that we reference it as convenience, it is a convenient way of sampling. Let's say our population is Ohio State students but our convenience sample takes place outside of the student union. If we were to sit outside of the student union to sample for our study for one hour on a random Tuesday afternoon, we would only potentially sample a portion of the entire population that we are sampling. However, this is probably because there's not a good frame or the way that we access that population. And so the convenience sample makes sense to sit outside of the union. And that's just one example. The next non-probabilistic sampling technique is the quota sample. This is where we use a specific number of selected groups or groups. We're interested in matching sample populations to population proportions. And here we don't know our frame. So an example of this would be that we want to research alcohol, alcohol excuse me, effect um, at a Buckeye football game. There is no such frame that exists. And so you decide to sample 100 people at the football game you decide to sample 49 males and 41 females because that represents the state of Ohio's population. It's important to know that if you don't, if you're going to use the quota sampling, that it is justified of what you're doing. So for example, this researcher found that Ohio's population was represented by 49% males and 51% females. And out of a sample size of 100, that is a representative sample. The next non-probabilistic sampling technique is purposive. So this is use of personal judgment or sample criteria, most usually established by the researchers, um, to select a sample for a specific purpose. We see purposive sampling a lot in qualitative research because we are, in qualitative research, we are trying to um, inductively explore a specific trait, characteristic, phenomena um, within our, our sample that we are, um, within our sample that we are researching. So for example, if we wanted to select students with a specific GPA or a specific range of a GPA, we would use purposive sampling for that. The next non-probabilistic sample is snowball. So this is where we would identify one person with the characteristics that we were seeking to explore and asking them purposively to identify other people with the, same, the similar characteristics that we are um, seeking to research based off of our research question or objective. 
we could, an example of this could potentially be in the LGBTQ plus community where individuals maybe haven't come out or we are seeking a certain characteristic in that that is not easily identified um, within a frame. So there's not a listserv of people, individuals who express characteristics that we are seeking out. So we might identify one person in hopes that they would be able to identify others or advertise our study so that others can enroll in the study as well. We are now going to talk about the benefits and limitations of non-probabilistic sampling techniques. So the benefits are that we are able to identify individuals who possess the knowledge, experience, um, who, who experienced our problem or experienced the phenomena being studied, which is extremely important um, in some aspects of research because we are narrowing down on a specific population or sample. Some limitations is that we can't infer to the population. So like I said, this um, sample, these sampling techniques cannot be generalizable, and we cannot estimate sampling error, um, and we cannot ensure representativeness within our sample because we have not sampled the entire population. So as we talk about probabilistic sampling techniques, um, it's important that we talk about generalization, and we can go back to this slide. Um, so when we sample probabilistically from our population, um, we can describe the data using statistics, make this inference, set a parameter, and generalize back to our population. So when we talk about generalizing, that, that is what we mean. And when we do it randomly, each individual in this population has a non-zero um, independent chance of being selected for the study, um, which makes this um, sampling, which makes probabilistic sampling techniques able to generalize. So as we get back into the types, we have a simple random sample and systematic random sample. Um, for me, these kind of go hand in hand. They are different. So a simple random sample with that we, we would randomly choose sub subjects from our frame. It is an unbiased estimate of the population. So we might assign them a random number. Um, we would assign each individual in our frame a random number and ask to randomly pick a certain number of individuals within our frame. The next is systematic sampling. So it's similar to simple random, but we would choose the 15th um, the 15th person or individual in our study to choose to send uh, our survey to or participate in our study. There are online resources like randomizer.org that will assign or randomly select these numbers for you to help you identify which individuals within the frame you would want to choose to invite to the study. The next is stratified. Random sampling, this is also generalizable. So this is similar to quota, um, but a little bit different. Um, you do need to have a rationale for sh um, stratifying. So populations um, have subgroups or um, stratas that may differ in the characteristics. Um, so for example, it could be um, potentially uh, race that you are exploring and you want to make sure that the uh, sample is representative of the population. And so you would randomly sample based off of a strata um, of those characteristics. The next is a cluster sample. So we would like to this is where we would have access to a certain population, but we don't have the money, resources, time to survey the entire population. So for example, we might want to seek out schools, um, school districts in the state of Ohio. So we might randomly assign each individual school district a number and we would randomly select 
certain school districts um, based on um, justification by the researchers. Usually cluster sampling is done multi in multi-stage. Um, so we would cluster sample. So we might choose individual school districts. And then within those school districts, we would pull uh, individual, individual frames from there. This is why that probabilistic sampling I'm sorry, this is why cluster sampling isn't necessarily generalizable, but it is still considered probabilistic because often we might randomly select, um, let's say a school district or a cluster um, a, or a unit, but we might not have access to the frame and so we might have to move on to the next school district or unit, whatever we define that as. Here's a picture. This is also found in your notes um, or in the module, excuse me, um, for you guys to reference. I thought it does a really good job of depicting an image of each of the prob probabilistic sampling techniques. So a couple rules of thumb um, and some helpful tips. Um, first, if you have less than 100 subjects within your population, just do a census. So if you have access to the frame uh, of anybody less than 100 subjects, survey or send the survey out to all of them. That way you can do a census um, type uh, sampling technique. Additionally, um, you had readings from Creechie and Morgan uh, about sample sizes. Review that. That gives a really good overview and also justification if you need to justify why you sampled a certain number of people based off of off of a population. And um, a couple big takeaways from this is that first generalizability depends upon the sampling technique. So don't um, you if you are trying to generalize back to your population, make sure you are using a sample technique that is probabilistic that gives every individual a um, non-zero independent chance of being selected to participate in your study. Additionally, we want to make sure that the technique is correct for the study. So not every technique is going to be correct for the study, and that's really dependent upon your purpose and your methods. And each has um, each sampling techniques has its own strengths and limitations. So make sure you review that before choosing a certain or specific sampling technique. It also has implications on statistical methods. So make sure you're considering if you are doing statistical analysis that you look at what your population or sample size needs to be for those power calculations to have the effect that you want them to. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me and I look forward to working with you all the rest of the semester. Thanks.